The first reel deals not with a specific trip into the high Arctic, but with the Arctic as a particularly difficult part of the globe for all animal and plant life as well as men to live. Man as well as the plants and animals must find ways of coping with the long winters and intense cold. I will skip around in drawing on the results of trips to four major high Arctic points in Alaska and Canada, Bering Strait, Point Barrel, Coppermine, and the Back River. Most people, I think, uh, think of the high Arctic or the far, far north as being a very, very uncomfortable place to be, and uh, in a good many ways, this is true. The heavy winds and heavy seas, fog on Bering Strait, and of course, snow blowing and blizzard conditions are thought of as typifying the far north and especially tremendously deep snow banks, which in certain local situations also uh, is true. But in the main, this is uh, by no means always the case in the far north. Also, you probably think about the untrustworthy, independable, unpredictable Eskimo dogs, which you never quite know whether you can make friends with or not used in traveling, of course, through the north, which is still true in local travel in a good many parts of the Arctic regions. However, a, an artist naturalist in the Arctic sees a great deal of beauty and interest from his standpoint, the bright sunlight on the ice cakes in Bering Straits, and the plants, the flowers, really put on a show during the short spring uh, in the far Arctic, and almost anybody would enjoy the bright, colorful landscapes that one can see in the far Arctic if he's there at this particular season. We'll look into some of the birds of the area, too, strange birds to us in the south, the stellar zider here, one of those peculiar acting Arctic birds which take the place of the mallards and teal that we see in the south, and the Bonaparte's gulls nesting in trees along the tree line, not on up into the far Arctic, of course, where the trees do not exist at all. The dense growth of the black spruce along the tree line have such heavy, solid limbs that the little chicks can creep around as though they were on the ground. The four points from which I'm going to draw the examples for the Arctic are the Bering Strait, the westernmost tip of Alaska, the northernmost tip of Alaska, Point Barrow, and farther to the east, the Coppermine area, mouth of the Coppermine River, and the Back River, which is northwest of Hudson's Bay, north of Chesterfield Inlet. These are the points that we're traveling to, and in traveling in the Arctic now, of course, the airplane is the one and only, almost, uh, means of transportation, the big jets to the main air bases, then the smaller propeller planes to the minor bases, and the Norseman plane, <coughs> which was a workhorse of the North for a good many years, the uh, Otter plane now taking the place of the Norseman, and in the wintertime, of course, smaller uh, ski planes are the planes used by the uh, bush, bush pilots to travel into the far distant points, the more remote parts of the Arctic. A gull-winged Stinson plane in which we flew out to the tip of the Bering Strait Peninsula, the Seward Peninsula. In traveling in the Arctic at uh, not too high elevations, it gives one a a wonderful opportunity to study drainage patterns in the structure of the earth, particularly in the fall and in the spring when the ground is only partially covered with snow. The erosion patterns of the river system show up beautifully from the air. You get information 
from the air that you do not get while traveling on the ground. But if one wants to really get familiar with the area firsthand and close range, this means traveling on the surface. Over the mountain tops, here's a good example of a couple of mountain glaciers joining up, flowing down the mountain like rivers, but still they are simply masses of glacial ice. The braided stream pattern of the Coppermine River shows a typically young, geologically, uh, stream. Walking on foot is where you really get acquainted with the Arctic. This is up in the Back River, where they're, of course, well beyond the tree line, several hundred miles, uh, where the vegetation is very scant. You get more the impression of the prairies in the on Bering Strait. A good deal of our work was done out on the sea ice, where traveling here was a rather rough, rough going. Notice no skis are being used. The snow in the Arctic blows and drifts into such solid drifts that uh, snowshoes are hardly necessary. Even in the spring, when the snow begins to soften, these Eskimos are going along very casually, sinking well in above their knees almost in the snow just over this little rise. And again, you'll notice, even under these conditions, the Eskimos are not using snowshoes. Dog teams are still used in the Arctic extensively. This uh, group of dogs are being fed on seal meat by an Eskimo who has just returned to Nome on a, a successful seal hunt. Dogs are tethered to keep them apart so they can be fed individually, keep from fighting, which is very often the case with the Arctic dogs. We found that uh, these animals were more friendly and less treacherous than we had anticipated they would be. Nowadays, the uh, snowmobile is beginning to, to replace dogs as a means of transportation and pulling their sleds in the Arctic. How rapidly and how completely these will take over is something of a question, because at a great distance from a base, the dogs would be far more dependable than snow sleds driven by motors. A motor trouble 100 miles from your base would be really a lethal experiment, experience for anybody in the Arctic. The uh, travel on water, uh, we go to the King Island Eskimos, who are now, many of them, living on the outskirts of Nome. They make uh, walrus skin boats out of driftwood, and the skill that they exhibited in constructing these frames was really quite amazing uh, to us. Their mechanical ability is really uh, very great. This was a 36-foot uh, frame, which was later to be covered with walrus skin. Most of the major parts were tied together with walrus thongs. Here, a small walrus skin boat was just being loaded by some of these King Islanders to go out on a seal hunt. They paint the outside often with white paint, and at a little distance, one would never suspect they were anything but a commercially produced uh, wooden boat but they are made of driftwood frames and covered with walrus skin and surprisingly seaworthy. Nowadays, of course, they use outboard motors, whereas previously they used sails and uh, oars or paddles. A walrus skin boat put up on the rack for the winter. Nowadays, I find that some of the Eskimos are beginning to use plywood in constructing of boats for the same purpose that they used the walrus skin boat. But the plywood boat is far less graceful in its lines and undoubtedly not as sturdy uh, as the walrus skin boat was. The Eskimos are going modern very rapidly, and uh, it's hard telling just how where they will end up. Some of the living quarters in the Arctic are really very modern. This was way up on Great Bear Lake where all the material was flown in or brought in by a track uh, uh, equipment over the snow in the wintertime. 
And of course, living in a place like this is very expensive, but uh, the Arctic is attractive to many people, especially for their fishing, and many go there. At Wales, Alaska, we were able to rent a small cabin or a building made by the Eskimos. Here we were able to use uh, semi, at least, civilized materials. When you get into the remoter parts of the Arctic, however, you must be self-sufficient, and uh, tents placed uh, tied down with rocks are usually the means of living in these remote parts of the Arctic region. The rock holding them down necessary because stakes can't be used in the permafrost. Laundry was done in this case by putting soapy water in our clothes into rubberized bags and rolled on the stones like a washboard. Very effective way of washing and keeping your hands dry while you are working under those rather chilly conditions. We put out a little short piece of net at our back river camp, got a big uh, lake trout there, but we already had a supply of lake trout and uh, let this one go. A number of species are found there that are the same species occurring in uh, northern Minnesota and throughout a large part of Canada, northern part of the states. The tulabi, uh, one of the closely allied to the whitefish group, and the uh, lake trout, a especially dark patterned lake trout, And the Arctic char, which is one of the sportsman's uh, prize fish, the enormous dorsal fin, identifies the grayling. And the Arctic char is perhaps the fish that most of the dyed-in-the-wool fishermen go to the Arctic to catch, a salmon-like, closely related to the trout uh, family. And the sport of capturing these is really quite exciting. The uh, certain river systems have brightly colored trout or, or char, whereas other uh, nearby systems may have uh, much, much less brilliantly colored uh, char. This was the Tree River where the females were quite pale in their color, but uh, the males were just surprisingly brilliant. I, I really was amazed to find that these large trout-like char were almost as brilliant in color as uh, are some of the little tropical fish uh, which we admire so much in our aquarias. This particular individual was one of the most brilliant that uh, the group brought in at that particular time. Unbelievably red. This is not an exaggeration of the actual color uh, which that fish had. The modernizing Eskimo has a many problems to deal with. In fact, any man living in the Arctic has problems which are different from the problems encountered in temperate and tropical regions. One of these uh, problems is to deal with the disposition of sewage and the water supply. In Nome, water is delivered by trucks, the same as we deliver fuel oil uh, down here in the States. Uh, Nome has never had a system of water supply or sewers, but at the present time they are thawing out the permafrost down to about 12 feet, excavating trenches down the middle of the streets, and they are beginning to install uh, heated tunnels built of three-inch redwood where the water supply pipes and the sewage pipes uh, will be uh, installed. Nome is uh, much like a northern or a western prairie town, uh, rather ramshackle houses to a large extent. During the gold rush, there were about 20,000 people here, and now only about 2,000, mostly Eskimos. Many of the buildings, in fact, most of them, are placed on large beams laid on the surface, and the pressure and the heat during the summer. Uh, melts the permafrost and the buildings settle and about every couple of times a year they've got to jack up their houses to make the doors and windows operate properly.
the foundations of larger buildings are now being refrigerated in order to keep the ground frozen and to prevent the larger buildings from settling during the summer season. The permafrost in many ways is one of the big problems to cope with in the Arctic. The midnight sun is always of interest in the Arctic regions. Here on Bering Strait was uh, located practically astride the Arctic Circle. And uh, just opening the lens a little, I was able to photograph birds uh, at midnight, the same as I would do at any other time of the day. At this point, the sun sank about half of its diameter below the surface. These are shots taken at 15-minute intervals. The horizon here cuts the sun almost exactly in two. Then the sun begins rising again. Farther to the north, of course, you get a much higher sun. Here at Point Barrow, which is a number of degrees north of the Arctic Circle, the sun doesn't get down to but uh, within about five degrees of the horizon. Again, moves up. These, again, are shots taken at 15-minute intervals uh, to indicate the level of the midnight sun. So the evening and night <coughs> are more or less like a sunset conditions that we experience here in the temperate zone. Again, opening up the lens a little, I took a picture of the hotel, which was in the outskirts of Barrow, uh, where we stayed the first night after dropping in there. Another problem of the Arctic is the insect life. Notice the head net, which uh, he has just lifted up off of his face in order to take a few shots of this ptarmigan, one of the very few very confiding birds of the Arctic regions. The mosquito is a very tiny insect, but an enormous problem in the north. And the abundance of mosquitoes uh, is almost unbelievable. They react, however, uh, to chemical repellents, and it is not too difficult to, at least to exist. These are not burrs, but uh, mosquitoes, and on this hat gives you some idea of the abundance of mosquitoes. In fact, this same man slapped his knee uh, at one time and killed 66 mosquitoes with one slap. My notebook in the Arctic uh, perhaps looks a little different from the average Arctic traveler. Since I was interested in the collecting of birds and the taking of color notes of the fleshy parts of some of the birds which we encountered, the puffins, and uh, here a young Arctic fox uh, which was trapped. This is the Arctic fox which turns pure white in the winter time, but uh, is a smoky gray and uh, light pattern during the summer. The peris are Arctic ground squirrel, very much like the prairie dog of the south. The ptarmigan chicks developing their wings rapidly. And the shorebirds, uh, a number of the tiny young shorebirds we knew little about and I was anxious to get uh, color sketches of the day-old chicks of these. And later, using the notes that taken in the field, I made paintings of the situation, particularly here with the king eiders migrating over the sea ice. Operating in the north, uh, skinning um, delicate operations of skinning and preparing birds, we worked inside of a white tent, admitting the light during the day, you may have noticed in the previous shot, one of the tents was dark colored in order to cut out the light to sleep at night. The vegetation of the Arctic is extremely interesting. Uh, you would think maybe there was none here, but it is very tiny. Here is a willow tree, believe it or not, compared with a penny up here on the right. The, in, the leaves and flowers are so tiny that you would almost pass them up. In fact, some Arctic plants are so small You've almost got to get down on your hands and knees in order to even notice them. These little saxifrages were only about a quarter of an inch across. The cotton grass is a type of grass that uh, thrives in the uh, little layer of unfrozen or melted uh, permafrost right on the surface throughout large tracts of the Arctic, throwing out these seed heads with the white tufts. The fireweed has flowers that are similar to the fireweed of the much larger plants in the south. But these plants are only eight or 10 inches high. Uh, 
able to withstand frost to the extent that those petals can freeze to be as brittle as cornflakes and still thaw out the next day and go on growing. In fact, a good many of the Arctic plants, well, a good many are uh, what we call cushion plants. They grow very tight against the ground in a little dome-shaped mound and produce enormous numbers of flowers and uh, later seeds off of these tiny, tiny little flowers. The cushion form is characteristic of a number of the Arctic species. One very, very tough little fern was able to survive clear up on the back river several hundred miles north of the tree limit, growing between the chinks in the rocks and never growing above the height of the rocks. The uh, Arctic arnica was the largest individual blossom that we found, but the plant itself was only six or eight inches high. You don't think of orchids as growing in the Arctic. This was a tiny little orchid uh, found on the tree line near Churchill. So the orchid family does invade the Arctic regions. The little poppy was an interesting one. It uh, bloomed one year and uh, froze up during the winter, covered by water several feet deep in this particular spot. The water drained off in the spring and these flowers then the following year began producing their seeds. The little uh, Arctic heather was a species, looked almost like uh, lilies of the valley, but it was a species of plant that could be burned without drying. It had enough resin in the leaves that you could actually use it as a fuel, although one did have to kind of keep blowing on it and feeding it in a little at a time in order to heat a little bit of your food uh, while you are working. The problems uh, dealt with in the Arctic by the birds uh, are interesting. The ptarmigan that turns pure white in the winter, of course, is using protective coloration uh, in to the very, very best advantage. Notice the feathered feet and legs clear down to the claws. The ptarmigan is covered with feathers in order to withstand the intense cold of the winters. These are male birds that are just beginning to take on their spring breeding plumage. The dark head turns uh, a rich dark brown while the body remains pure white. And this again is a protective device because as the snow melts in the spring, the patchy color is a protective coat. The female changes her plumage much more rapidly in the spring than does the male. And uh, shortly after the snow is largely off, she begins nesting, and the uh, broken up pattern of the feathers on the female willow ptarmigan is about the most perfect uh, camouflage that one could find anywhere. In fact, we ate our lunch within a few feet of this nesting bird for several days without noticing that there was a ptarmigan sitting on a nest under this little dead spruce almost within arm's length. Even the eggs are spotted and the young chicks when they hatch are uh, mottled and spotted with the same colors. Here the male in its full breeding plumage with its uh, rich chestnut head, red ornaments over the eyes which expand uh, during the excitement of courtship. Still the pure white body is retained for some time and several weeks as the weeks go by in the early part of summer, here on the 4th of July, the bird is beginning rapidly now to change to a dark body color, uh, very similar to that of the female. And the complete change will be accomplished within another very, very short time. Notice their colors matching the brown of the peat in the surrounding tundra. Some of the tiny songbirds are even able to survive up here. The little red pole, a bird about the size of our goldfinch, which builds a very, very well-built nest. And you'll notice on close shots here that the red pole is using the molted fe white feathers of the ptarmigan to line the nest and to keep, uh, keep in the heat and to keep out the cold giving it the opportunity to successfully incubate its eggs. These birds, of course, migrate to the south in the winter and are not called upon to survive the northern uh, temperatures. The same is true of the godwit, the Hudsonian godwit, one of the large shorebirds, 
a uh, little bit smaller than a pigeon, but one of the farthest travelers of all of the birds of the world, nesting far up into the tundra, well beyond the limit of trees, a good many of them, and many of them traveling as far south as Terra del Fuego at the south tip of South America during the Arctic winter. Again, a beautiful case of camouflage. They have to start nesting quickly and get their young out of the egg and uh, matured onto the wing so they can travel uh, down to South America uh, before the snows fall in late September. So the very short season in the Arctic has to crowd in a lot of living on the part of the birds. The uh, stellar zider is uh, one of the four species of eiders characteristic of Arctic America. Small bird here that is similar in its uh, nesting habits in these little pr uh, tundra ponds, a good deal like our blue-winged teal nesting in the little prairie puddles in the Midwest and up into Canada. These birds are extremely hardy. They only go south on the ocean down to about the Aleutian Islands, the main body of the population. And uh, in the very, very early spring, they move northward through Bering Strait uh, on up into the Arctic and uh, nesting along the Arctic coast of Canada, Alaska, and Siberia, and on up into the northern islands of Canada. Notice the extremely different plumage of the female here. No relationship indicated at all as far as plumage pattern goes. I wish all b Arctic birds would be as accommodating as this particular stellar zider, which uh, sat there quietly, allowed me to photograph the breast pattern. It then turned to the side, showing that odd little black dot on the white side, and then turned clear around and exhibited the black pattern before leaving. Definitely, they do not all act as accommodating as this. One of the species that nests in the rocky hillsides and mountainous areas of uh, the north is the raven, one of the hardiest of all of the northern birds and one that remains many times. In fact, most of the time, the Arctic ones will remain through the dark Arctic winter. Just how they are able to find food is, is puzzling, although it may be that these wintering populations have located a stranded, uh, possibly a walrus carcass, or a polar bear kill, or uh, possibly even a whale, where they can get a constant supply of food throughout the winter. Playful, ingenious sort of birds. They nest in these rocky cliffs, very inaccessible in their no uh, nesting areas. This particular pair had young about half grown by the middle of May, but uh, suddenly the whole family of young birds died in the nest. We were very puzzled as to why this might have happened, although we speculated that it might have been uh, feeding on the liver of a polar bear, which had been shot a few miles away by the Eskimos. The liver of polar bear is poisonous because of the high concentration of vitamin A. The mammals of the Arctic uh, being photographed here, are, this one is the Perry's ground squirrel or Arctic ground squirrel, perhaps the animal in the world that sees less of the sunlight in daytime than any other animal. It uh, remains under the snow, sleeping during the winter time, not a true hibernator because it apparently does wake up and feed on its stored food supplies under the snow during the winter but in the summertime, it comes out seemingly only on rather bright sunny days. And in many parts of the Arctic, the bright sunny days are very much in the minority. So even during the approximately three months of the summer, uh, these little fellows remain underground, do not expose themselves uh, above ground. Here they're feeding on the little Arctic avens or dry ass the leaves and also the flowers, providing food for the little Perry's ground squirrel. 
One of the animals living nearby one of these prairie ground squirrel colonies was a, an arctic fox, which had a system of burrows at this particular place. Here was a, a prairie ground squirrel that they had brought in and had not yet eaten. The arctic fox was extremely hard to approach, and uh, it would lie at the mouth of the burrow until you got uh, within uh, a few hundred feet, and then it would almost invariably disappear down the burrow. The arctic fox is one of those, uh, as I mentioned, that turns pure white in the winter, one of the best uh, fur producers of the Arctic. This very striking dark and light pattern in the summertime was very, very different from the winter pelage. Notice the short ears representing Allen's law, which indicates that Arctic animals tend to have short appendages, so they will not freeze. This is the winter pelage of the Arctic fox, which is such a valuable fur bearer and a good supply of income for the Eskimo. One of the foods of the, another of the foods of the Arctic fox, in addition to the Perry's ground squirrel, is the collared lemming, which is abundant in some parts of the Arctic, and another species of lemming called the Bax lemming, or brown lemming, which uh, is abundant in other parts of the Arctic region. These are small creatures, about uh, somewhat larger than a meadow mouse, perhaps the size of a hamster. This one looks almost identically like a little muskrat, but lacks a tail almost completely. These are the little animals that become so explosively abundant during certain periods in the north. About every four years, their population builds up here at Point Barrow. They were extremely abundant during one of our visits. While we're talking about Arctic mammals, we should mention the Arctic, uh, the Eskimo dog. The Eskimo dog is really a, a most hardy uh, species of animal. The Eskimos never build them kennels or give them any protection of any kind. The animal is simply staked out on the snow and uh, the dog curls up at night the wind blows the snow over him, and he is covered up by a blanket of snow. Going around this particular morning to photograph these at Wales, Alaska, a number of these dogs burst out of the snow right in front of me, for I didn't realize there was any dog at all. On this particular day, this was in the afternoon, and they were simply curled up resting on the out, out of the snowbanks. But the fact that these animals can survive the winter at 30, 40 below zero, with the wind blowing heavily as it often does, makes it seem almost impossible that they could have a coat of fur that would uh, do them this much good. The, the caribou, of course, is the animal which is also adapted to living in the Arctic. It has a, a dense uh, coat of hair, hollow tubular hairs, which... Uh, provide the Eskimo with his most perfect clothing yet devised by man for surviving the Arctic. The caribou has a wide cloven hoof which spreads out, enabling it to walk on top of the snow. And of course, as I mentioned, this Arctic snow is rather hard drifted and uh, they do not sink in like the moose and the deer do down in the forested parts of North America. But the caribou are able to walk right on the surface of most of this uh, hard drifted and hard packed snow. Caribou comes, of course, in, in tremendous herds often, and uh, this is one of the major sources of, of a living for what is called the Arctic, uh, the caribou Eskimo. The polar bear, of course, is another adapted to the north and uh, again, living under conditions that seem absolutely impossible. They live among the floating ice cakes and uh, swim in the cold, chilly water. Uh, part of the time, their hair and their fur is so beautifully adapted to resisting water and to retaining heat uh, that the polar bear seems to be perfectly adapted to uh, the Arctic or polar survival. This is one step away from the seals, of course, and the other types of mammals which are permanently aquatic, but which we will not uh, deal with in this particular film.
Turning to the Eskimo himself, he's a very resourceful person. In fact, perhaps the most independent and self-reliant people in the world. We dropped in here on the Back River to visit this group of Eskimos, some of which uh, very possibly uh, have never been into uh, white man's civilized uh, trading posts at all. The men largely moved in to do the shopping at Baker Lake, which was some 200 miles to the south, and uh, many of these women probably had never uh, been in to the Baker Lake camp at all. You'll notice their clothing are partly of uh, westernized, civilized uh, cloth, whereas a good deal of their clothing is of caribou skin or seal skin. These were on near Chantry Inlet and uh, were Eskimos that were dependent partially on the caribou and partially on the seal from the ocean. The uh, pure caribou Eskimos live in the interior and their economy is based almost entirely on the caribou. Not the most cleanly people, as you can see, but uh, living under these conditions, it's uh, very understandable that they would not want to do the laundry any more frequently than they really had to. The simple fact that they can survive at all under these conditions is, is really amazing. Notice the baby carried in the backpack or almost like a hood of a parka. She brought the youngster out for just a moment to get a picture. It was protected from the mosquitoes in this backpack, using towels over their heads to keep the mosquitoes away. In spite of their crude, rough appearance, the women were ex expert needlewomen. They were able to sew seal skin with a double type of uh, seam, which was waterproof. Originally, they used bone needles and sinew from the caribou. Now they use uh, steel needles, of course. But uh, their skill at making mukluks, which are foot gear to be used in water and wet, slushy conditions, uh, was really quite an amazing product of these primitive peoples. All of the Eskimos have their dogs always tethered out, keep them from escaping, and also to keep them from fighting. Variable in color all the way from black to white. This is perhaps one of the last of the really caribou skin tents that one might encounter among the Arctic Eskimos since they're becoming modernized rather rapidly. This was made of caribou skin. You notice they do have harness snaps and ropes as guys, originally they used walrus or seal skin thongs to, uh, to guy down the tent. We were not able to discuss, uh, to speak English, but uh, one of our men was demonstrating the use of chemical insect repellents. We had a good supply of it and left quite a number of bottles with the Eskimos at this point. A white Arctic wolf skin that uh, one of the hunters had brought in in fact, this was one of the most skillful of the hunters of this particular uh, colony of Eskimos living on the Back River. Looks like a bronze carving. Probably the oldest of all of the Eskimos of the Back River area. I believe, talking with the Hudson Bay man, that he was perhaps in his 60s. Our bush pilot was trying to use a little dictionary and converse with these Eskimos who seemed to know no English we wanted to tell them that we had left a lot of material cached for them 25 miles upstream and that they could have it uh, when they went up there the next time. Uh, farther up the back, some 75 miles at uh, Escape Rapids, we encountered another group of Eskimos, a small family, which probably were as self-reliant and independent uh, as anybody that you could find anywhere on the globe and how they can survive under these conditions, it really is amazing. They were fishing in this rapids uh, for uh, Arctic char. Looking at them individually, we could see readily that uh, the, the mongoloid characteristics of the facial expressions, although some of them did appear to be uh, at least partially uh, half-breeds, 
the slanting eyes and the high cheekbones appear. And however, this uh, girl could probably walk down any American street and would never be uh, looked at twice as suggesting any mongoloid characteristics in her features. These people visited Baker Lake only once a year, which was over 200 miles away, going in there with their dog teams, doing their Christmas shopping. It seemed strange to us that they would go there during the coldest part of the winter to do their shopping and then come back up and uh, live the rest of their life along the back river at this point. These were caribou skin boots with the fur inside. The main diet in the summer at least was fish. They relied on caribou during other parts of the year. We had noticed coming down the river the piles of stones along the bank of the river, which puzzled us. And we found later that these were simply piles of stones put up uh, to support the leather thongs or ropes on which they tr dried their fish. The fish was uh, simply split, folded back over the cord, and allowed to dry, used for their own food, as well as supplying food uh, for their dogs. And again, their major means of transportation, and of course a very valuable item of possession among the Eskimos was their dogs. Again, extremely variable in their color and characteristics. Perhaps one of the Eskimos which uh, had seen more of primitive living than any other that we encountered uh, was a woman in the copper mine band of Eskimos who still had some of the tattooing which many Eskimos used in the early days. Well, the Arctic then does appear not to be entirely a mass of snow and ice and it is the home of a lot of colorful plants and interesting animals and also some very, very resourceful people living under these extremely difficult conditions. We're now going on a specific trip chronologically narrated into Alaska, first over the Cascade Mountains from Minneapolis west to Seattle and then northward along the British Columbia coast making a few stops en route to Anchorage, where we arrived only a few weeks after the earthquake, which had done rather extensive damage to the city of Anchorage. And of course, we became acquainted with the Alaskan flag, which I had never seen before. Interesting Big Dipper and the North Star. Some of the damage was being repaired, but this parking lot was still in rather bad shape. Rather a shock to come to your parking lot and find it in a condition like this. The uh, fault line of the causing the earthquake went diagonally through the business part of town and on through the city. On the right, a good deal of excavating and cleaning up had been already carried out. One of the badly damaged buildings had been made of precast concrete slabs which toppled off onto the street. Good many of them cracked, but not yet dropping. This was an apartment house at rather precarious angles. All through the town, the buildings were shuffled around in a very strange fashion. One of the buildings, this uh, unintentional split-level apartment building, had a sign pasted on the window that read, we knew it was hard to make a living here, but we didn't think we'd go in the hole like this. The tallest building in Anchorage 
At a distance appeared to be intact and to have withstood the earthquake in good shape. But on closer inspection, it was quite obvious that the building was very, very badly damaged. And a year later, it was still unrepaired, but I believe they are going to attempt to uh, retain the building and uh, to repair it. After the Anchorage stop, we uh, went uh, over the Alaskan range to Nome and uh, on the Seward Peninsula, which is the western tip of Alaska, flying over the Alaska Range, which is the range containing Mount McKinley, although we did not see Mount McKinley. Coming in over Nome, we stopped uh, only momentarily there for a very short time. On the outskirts of Nome is one of the largest gold dredges in the world, but inactive at the present time because of uh, wages for the men to operate the dredge makes it unproductive economically, although there is a tremendous amount of gold yet to be taken out of the gravel in that area. Bubble gum, westernized civilization coming in with the primitive here. I presume this is a babysitter, although I wasn't really sure enjoying themselves down along the beach like so many of us do in the summertime. But the summertime here was pretty chilly. Even at that, the youngster isn't too heavily clothed. Being an ornithologist, I was much interested in the number of Jaegers chasing the gulls, causing them to drop their prey. The Jaeger is a gull-like bird with the habits of a hawk predatory bird living on lemmings and small birds. The Arctic tern, a bird that travels farther in the year than almost any other animal in the world, going clear down to Antarctica and returning to the extreme North Arctic for the nesting season. From Nome, we went by bush pilot across another range of mountains over to Wales, Alaska, a tiny little Eskimo village right out on the very, very western tip of the Seward Peninsula opposite Siberia. This was in early May, but uh, it looked like uh, January or February, certainly like January or February down here, and not like we think of as a May day. Practically the whole population of Eskimos from Wales were out to meet the plane, as they always do. Planes do not fly on schedule there, but they simply fly when the weather is adequate and when there is a need for flying to the village. The youngsters are always curious and friendly, well-clothed. Notice the uh, wolverine skin uh, fur around some of the parkas, a red fox on one, I noticed. They were very curious about us. We were collecting specimens and photographing birds, and they had a strong suspicion we were game enforcement agents. A very bashful little ass. A pretty dreary looking situation. The town was not, the houses were not built on a street. They were zigzagged, and anywhere the person apparently wished to build a house. Here was the main store, the Wales Village store, and uh, Pete Seradlik, uh, one of the Eskimos who had put up a battery-run electric plant in his home and had a telephone line to his brother's house at the other end of the village. The youngsters played baseball of some sort out on the ice until 11 or 12 o'clock at night. Up on uh, Wales Mountain, just back of the village, was an ancient cemetery, which was of considerable interest to us. In the notch in the skyline there, they were not able to bury their dead, so they put the dead in caskets uh, made of driftwood and uh, simply put them on top of the mountain here, laid stones on them. The caskets disintegrated, 
many of the belongings and prizes of the people were put with their uh, graves. There was a group of polar bear skulls. Apparently this particular man uh, had been a very good hunter. And uh, the skulls of some of his polar bear prizes had been brought in, a human skull with a polar bear jaw. Apparently after the caskets disintegrate, the polar bears and timber wolves and foxes disturbed things considerably. What appear to be wooden poles here, many of them are whale ribs or whale jaw bones. Some of them are wood and apparently uh, parts of boats or masts of ships uh, or small boats that the Eskimos had owned. They do not use this cemetery anymore. They haven't used it for a number of years. They uh, now attempt to bury their dead in the sandbar down near the ocean. The shoulder blade of a whale, apparently a choice trophy of one of the Eskimos, and some of the very gruesome sights reminded one of Halloween decorations, but this was the real thing. Even with the temperature only a few degrees, three or four degrees above freezing, the snow was already beginning to melt rather rapidly. We had only been there a few days when some Eskimos arrived by boat from the Diomede Islands. They had been running out of food in their little store and had come over to Wales to get some supplies. On the left was a biologist uh, here who had been studying the walrus populations uh, on in Bering Strait. This uh, crew of Eskimos had been hunting walrus on the way over and they had a large pile of heads and tusks of, es of uh, walrus that they'd taken. Diomede Islands are midway between Alaska and Siberia. This was the home of this particular group of Eskimos of which there are about 75 that still live on the Little Diomede Island which belongs to uh, the United States to Alaska, whereas the Big Diomede is uh, Russian. This was about a 32-foot walrus skin boat made of driftwood and covered with walrus skin. A very seaworthy little, little boat, and of course one that had to have a fairly sizable crew to manage it. It was quite heavy, but really uh, most remarkably seaworthy. They said they did not go on any sort of a schedule, and if we went with them, we'd have to take our chances on when we would get back. We uh, assumed that it would be within uh, a number of days or certainly weeks, and so we took the chance and went with them, uh, hoping to get back when they would go walrus hunting again. There was open water for some miles. It was about 27 miles out to the Little Diomede Island, and there navigating ability was really amazing. They had a large compass screwed to one of the seats and they had wristwatches and this was their complete navigating equipment. As soon as they began encountering uh, uh, cakes of ice floating about, they began looking for walrus. Here was a small part, a group of walrus. They cruised up very slowly directly at them. Their eyesight is not very good. At about 50 yards or a little less they began shooting and they had to shoot them in the ear, back of the head, in order to kill a walrus. And of this group of about a half a dozen, they killed only one. One of the young bulls, which they feared, uh, came up within only six or eight feet of the boat, and they shot it over at us to push them away with the oar, which we weren't too anxious to do, but. They did not come up and do any damage to the boat. They simply uh, hopped off on the ice cake, cut off the head containing the tusks, tossed the head into the boat, and left the carcass there. They do not make use of any part of the carcass except in a very limited number of them, uh, which they use for food and when they need walrus skin for a boat cover. They're navigating on to uh, the island, uh, really amazed us, and they hit the island right in the middle, 
Our first view of the island was a very, very foggy uh, look at the rocky cliffs with the ice and snow filling the little uh, gullies eroded into the rocky surface. They cruised around the edge of the island. The island is only about two miles long. There is no level ground on the Little Diomede Island except at the top, which is something uh, 2,000 feet high. So the village where the Eskimos live was built on the sloping side of the rock cliff. Large numbers of seabirds flying about constantly, and these, of course, were one of our primary points of interest. Driftwood was uh, part of the material seen here, although some of the tall poles standing up were actually whale ribs and whale jaw bones. The constant gasoline barrels, which are an insignia of the Arctic these days, Many of the houses have been built of a uh, rather primitive way with driftwood. Some had been shipped in. Here was the modern school building. Here one of the walrus skin boats pulled up on the rocky shore and a youngster shooting birds with a sling. The only time that I've ever seen that type of a sling used uh, really in a practical way. The type of sling that David was supposed to have killed Goliath with. He really was pretty good, had lots of ammunition. A day or two later, he had struck a young gull in a particular plumage we were interested in, and I bought the gull from him, and it's now in our collection. The vegetation on Little Diomede, of course, uh, contains no trees whatsoever, very tiny uh, plant life. The plants grow out from the little bit of soil between the rocks, Creeping out over the rocks, you can peel up the vegetation uh, like lifting up a rug. And it looks not unlike the fiber pads that are often used under rugs. Looking out over the icy channel between the big and little diomede, we can see the low-hanging clouds here covering most of the big diomede island, which uh, is Russian possession. We studied the island very carefully, but saw no indications of occupation except a little tiny house, apparently a little lookout of some sort, up on the crest of the uh, hill under the little smoky cloud on the right in this particular shot. Apparently all of the Russian installations, of which there are several, are on the far side of the island, and the little Diomede Eskimos are not able to check what is going on. From the top of Little Diomede, you can look over the Big Diomede and see the Siberian coast in the distance, which is roughly 25 to 30 miles away. The uh, coast is roughly 60 miles across, the strait is roughly 60 miles across at this point. We were interested in the fact that uh, migrating birds did pass between Siberia and North America by this course. Some of the more primitive houses uh, were built of stone, entered by a long tunnel, like the entrance to an igloo, but the houses were built of uh, driftwood, and surprisingly enough, they had no windows, and this is not what you might suspect it to be, but this is the door uh, in the floor. You come in under the floor and come up through a hole uh, into the uh, living quarters. And the only window is a skylight in the roof. The possessions were all put on uh, shelves built around the outside of the wall. There were no furniture except a bed uh, with a little wooden wall around it. And actually the Eskimos here were heating this small room uh, with an oil burning, uh, seal oil burning lamp. Although they did have so, uh, several of the houses had electricity running from the electric plant which was supplying the school building nearby. A very strange combination of uh, the ancient and the modern together. The uh, seal oil lamp was uh, just a metal pan uh, with a piece of cloth hanging over the edge, tipped up at an angle, burning seal oil. The school 
students and their teacher. The teacher uh, was from Oklahoma, I believe it was. The youngsters here were playing a game of baseball, they called it. They said it was Norwegian baseball. The pitcher stands beside the batter, swinging, and the ball is thrown to hit the people. I didn't uh, get the rules exactly, but uh, they were having a grand time on what was as near level ground as was found on the island. The adults were standing around with their parka hoods up. During the long, dark winter night, the, uh, the men spent a lot of their time carving ivory, and this is one of their principal uh, sources of income, using primitive drills yet. But they are very skillful mechanically. A little tiny shelf by the window. Here is Silas Womanasiak, an Eskimo is drilling holes in little segments of, a, of ivory to be made into bracelets. And the skill they exhibit in uh, making these uh, uh, carvings and jewelry was really uh, surprising. This uh, bracelet made of cross sections of a walrus tusk with Canada geese carved in and the, uh, a little bit of India ink rubbed into the surface. A beautiful walrus. The Diomede Islanders were, were some of the best of the carvers of the north, although Silas there was actually from Wales and was the best uh, carver in Wales. The orange is fossil ivory dug up out of the gravel. The black is whalebone. The gray is mastodon tusk. And they used these four colors very ingeniously in constructing their jewelry. A little Arctic hare and a polar bear, which uh, Silas carved for me, which I prize very highly. The oil barrels on the beach are always to be found in the Arctic, and one day the Eskimos here at Little Diomede decided to clean up the waterfront. They rolled many of these empty oil barrels into the sea, and they drifted along with the uh, current and the wind uh, to a point opposite the Big Diomede, and then the row of barrels turned and flowed, uh, drifted straight over toward Russia. So they were donating their junk oil barrels uh, to the Russians at this particular time. Typically dark, foggy, low-hanging clouds, many, many birds. So the sea supplies food for large populations of birds. And the gulls, particularly, are there in large numbers. The kittiwake gull, uh, a sea gull, which we never see in the interior at all. Here was the young, immature, plumaged kittiwake, uh, which the Eskimo boy hit with his sling, and I uh, got for the collection at the uh, university. Very skillful flyers. They spend almost their entire life on the wing, and as a consequence, their legs and feet are very small. The Pacific fulmar, a seabird closely related to the albatross, was one that uh, I had never seen before. A number of these strictly marine birds were of tremendous interest to me. The big white patches on the wings identified the fulmars rather readily. These bright orange-billed little birds were crested auklets the auklet population ran way up into the tens of thousands. This was a bird with a body about the size of a blue-winged teal and a species which the Eskimos used as a significant part of their food. The little least auklet was only six or eight inches long, but having almost no tail, it did have a body about the size of a robin or a little bit larger, although they were too small for the Eskimos to be considering as food. The birds, in spite of the 24 hours of daylight, ran on a schedule, leaving uh, very early in the morning to go out to sea to feed, and if one went up on the mountainside during the morning, you could not find a single auklet. During the afternoon hours, they began coming in, and late in the afternoon, there would be thousands and thousands of these little auklets. Notice the white iris. All of the auklets seem to have white irids. I don't know why that is. The crested auklet has this brilliant orange-red bill, uh, 
and the very striking recurved tuft of feathers growing up from the base of the bill on their forehead. They have, were just beginning to arrive in large numbers, and uh, they were pairing off, beginning to go through some of their courtship antics. Uh, one of the, uh, their calls sounded like a little tiny terrier dog barking, and very often climbing over the rocks, you'd hear them barking underneath you in the hollows under the rocks. The little strange uh, uh, wattle of red, orange, is plucked off by the Eskimos and dried and used later as fish bait, they told me. Their method of capturing the auklets for food was to use this uh, strange-looking net, a long handled, uh, about 14 feet long, of driftwood with this rather odd figure eight shaped uh, net on the end, made so that the birds would not uh, pop out once they were able to capture them on the wing. They became quite skillful in sweeping the birds out of the air. They would hide among the rocks and the auklets would fly along close to the rocks. And what they did after they captured them was what was surprising to us. They threaded a little leather thong through the nostril and tied them onto a, a leather rope, which was uh, stretched between rocks. And there the auklets hung and flapped their wings for hours, acting as a lure to bring other auklets into them. And it was quite successful. I actually saw auklets drop in and light almost uh, beside uh, this flapping group of auklets, apparently puzzled over what had happened. The Eskimos didn't seem to consider this cruel. In fact, I don't believe they used the word cruel. It apparently was not in their vocabulary. This was simply their ancestral way of doing, and they are still doing it today, although it is rather disturbing to us to see them handling the birds in this way. I asked uh, this Eskimo, who was the janitor at the school building, by the way, how many he might expect to get on a good day. And he said during one afternoon they would sometimes get as many as 75 or 80 auklets. These were plucked and frozen, put down under the permafrost, under the frozen rocks, and used later as a source of food. They didn't always get their bird, but uh, they did prove to be quite skillful. We tried sweeping at them, and uh, we couldn't come within number of feet of the bird as he went by. So you develop a skill there like a baseball batter and hitting a big league pitcher. The ice in the harbor and the shore of the strait here was always of interest. Depending on the direction of the wind and the strength of the wind, the uh, beating waves carved it up into odd forms. Quite often, these forms would resemble mushrooms where a large mass of ice might be suspended on a small pedestal. <coughs> the youngsters had a game of playing, jumping from ice cake to ice cake, no matter how dangerous this might be. None of the Eskimos seemed to be able to swim. Because the water was so cold, they never had the opportunity to even try to learn to swim. The sea ice was locked into the shore fairly substantially, a little farther up the island, I went along and studied the uh, cliff nesting species of birds, which uh, build up in population much greater a little later in the season. This was the uh, latter part of uh, June in this particular time. These are the kittiwakes. The small gull, it is similar to the ring-billed gull, which we know down in the States. They were beginning to pair off and establishing possession of their nesting ledges. Most birds, as you may know, defend territories of varying size, but the territory size of the kittiwake was just the nesting ledge on the, containing the nest. The myrrh, a bird with a body about as big as a big mallard, was perhaps the most abundant or would become the most abundant of the uh, cliff nesting birds at this particular place. The eggs of these cliff nesting birds were gathered and eaten by the Eskimos later. They dangled themselves down over the rope, uh, over the ledge with long walrus skin st uh, strips. The little dove key was our prize uh, find on this trip. It had never yet been, before, been uh, 
observed as nesting in Alaska anywhere, and we did find several pairs nesting here on the Little Diomede. We stayed for six days, and one morning, about 4.30 in the morning, they rapped on our window and said they were going out walrus hunting, and if we wanted to go back to Wales, uh, we could jump in the boat and go along. So we packed up our mm, belongings on very short notice and uh, headed back for Wales, making a stop at another little rocky island called Fairway Rock on the way back. My companion got a lot of interesting stories from the storekeeper who was the captain of the boat, Andrew. I did not get his Eskimo name. Here was a ribbon seal found on one of the ice cakes was shot. It was a small animal, about 150 pounds, and being as small as it was and having a good merchantable fur and uh, edible flesh, they took the entire carcass along, in this case, tossing it into the boat. At another point, a female walrus was found <coughs> and was, they were a bit puzzled, uh, uh, stating that the females always go by through the straits early in the year and why this female was still here, they were puzzled. They had intended taking the flippers of this particular one for food, uh, but uh, they talked it over and decided that since this was late in the season, uh, there must be something wrong with this animal, so they simply cut the head off, taking the, the tusks and uh, leaving the rest of the carcass. The tusks of the females are not quite as large, but of better quality, they told me, than the tusks of the bull walrus. Cruised around among the ice cakes for some time looking for more walrus, but then uh, decided to cut across the open water over to Wales, and then some of the Eskimos took that opportunity to, to doze off and take a little nap. The ability of these Eskimos to manage these boats and the skill with which they cut through the water was really uh, amazing to us. Notice the walrus skin pulled up over the gunnel and lashed down to the uh, frame on the inside. Walrus skin is amazingly strong. Here he's signaling his way in among the ice cakes, landing at Wales. This was near the end of June, although there still was lots of snow and ice about. Hopping off onto the beach, I noticed the women here at Wales were just cutting up an ugruk, or a bearded seal, a seal that weighs six or seven hundred pounds, one of their major sources of food. Nearby, another Eskimo woman was cutting the blubber off of another seal skin. I went over and took a few shots of her using these ulus, or woman's knife, a type, a very efficient type of a knife for this type of work. Gauging her in conversation, I, she said, well, I understand you know Dr. Bailey from Denver. He was here back in the 1920s, and I was a girl of only 18 at that time. I helped him prepare the walrus skins, which are now in the museum, in the Denver Museum. All of these Eskimos, of course, are educated at least to the eighth grade, all speak English quite fluently except the very old. Mrs. Emuk, or Mrs. Outwater, as it's translated, was the wife of the minister. She had a new grook also buried in a snowbank back of her cabin. She had gone out to get some meat for dinner, and I took these shots. I was amused by the expression on the face of this uh, bearded seal. She invited us to dinner that evening. We went over and had seal liver which was extremely good. I, I liked it better than any of the liver that we have here of, of beef liver. We encountered one of the rarest of North American birds here at Wales, the little white wagtail, which had, was building a nest inside of a deserted ca uh, shack. Only a few pairs of these nest on the western tip of the Seward Peninsula, and from the east they are invading North America by way of Iceland uh, to the edge of Greenland. So probably there are few, fewer individual white wagtails than almost any other North American bird. <laughs>
We soon packed up our belongings, a little Platus Porter plane, a Swiss-built plane, dropped in on the sand beach to pick us up and take us back to Nome. Back in Nome, they were celebrating the Midsummer uh, Midnight Sun Festival, as they called it. All of the Eskimos were out in their brightly colored parkas for summer use, the cloth parkas. Many of the visitors were renting colored parkas, too, mixing her in with the Eskimos in looking over their celebration. One of the events in their celebration was blanket tossing, but in this case the blanket was just a big walrus hide with sli slits cut in the edge of the skin. And they gripped those for handles and uh, did their blanket tossing in this way. <coughs> Another one of the events of the Midnight Sun Festival was a raft race out on Nome River. Practically all the cars owned in Nome were out there about seven miles out from town. The raft race was two miles down the Nome River. The raft regulations were that it must be built of anything except a bona fide boat. And they built them all, out, they built them out of everything except, uh, including oil barrels, Hilex bottles and beer cans, anything that would float. A big hole in the center here where they could take it over the riffles successfully and quickly. Quite a hilarious time was had by the raft racers. Nearby, the vice president of the bank had his wilderness retreat, not a very romantic-looking place since there was no timber, uh, but there was very good fishing here on the Nome River. On the way back, we stopped, and uh, the caretaker of some property there that was being held by a company for gold production later panned one pan of gold just for our amusement, and in just about 10 or 15 minutes, he panned out what he said was between two and three dollars worth of gold. A very small teaspoon would contain these particles of gold. Well, we hopped on up to Kotzebue, uh, stopped there for a day or two, and then on up the northwest coast of Alaska uh, by commercial airline in this case on up to Point Barrow. We landed at the village of Barrow about 10.30 at night. And uh, since it was approaching, uh, we, we went on out then the next day to the Arctic Research Laboratory, uh, which was a, a village of Quonset huts, really, a rather large village, which was really the originally the uh, base of operations for the developing of the dew line radar uh, stations in that part of the world. This has now been turned over to the University of Alaska, and it's used as a headquarters for Alaskan uh, Arctic research. Notice the airplane tires used on the trucks. The gravel was so soft that the smaller tires of ordinary cars could not be used. Much of this was biological work, and here a uh, family of Arctic wolves were kept in captivity that were being uh, tested uh, in some way physiologically by a biologist from, I believe, the University of Iowa. I found that a friend of mine from some years back, Dr. Patilka from the University of California, was there studying the wildlife of the region. His personal transportation was this little track vehicle, uh, which took him out over the tundra. Fortunately for us, the lemmings were at a high in their population. And the ground that was being uncovered as the snow banks melted away was uh, literally perforated and intersected in every direction by the tunnels of the little lemmings. And as you walked along, uh, you sometimes would see two or three lemmings running about in their burrows uh, right ahead of you. I had never before encountered a high in the population of lemmings in the Arctic and was very glad to 
have this opportunity. They literally were eating themselves out of house and home, and Dr. Patelka and those uh, studying them were expecting a, an explosive drop uh, in their population, a, a catastrophic drop, probably a better term, because they, they die off very rapidly from apparently a number of different causes, not always the same until the lemming almost completely disappears. The predatory animals and mammals and birds were, of course, abundant, too, because of the population of lemmings. Here the Pomerine Jaeger, the big uh, parasitic or, or predatory gull, uh, which uh, lives on lemmings, was nesting there in, in considerable numbers. strange decorative tail feathers these birds have that rotate 90 degrees on their shaft, uh, giving a very odd look to the extended longer tail feathers in the center of the tail. The male is the white breast and the gray collar of the female. Here she's settling down on the eggs, which of course placed on the surface of the tundra here. The Jaegers very often appear in a melanistic form, a superabundance of black pigment. In other words, they mask the normal pattern of the bird and they're jet black all over. Here, a Jaeger is picking up and swallowing whole a lemming. The lemmings are actually so abundant that they would often let them run by within just a few feet without their paying any attention to them. Another of the, pre well, uh, one of these uh, melanistic Jaegers uh, was nesting nearby. Another of the predators that was quite abundant was the snowy owl. Again, I had never seen the snowy owl in the Arctic, and here, because of the abundance of lemmings, there were quite a number of them nesting on these little hummocks in the tundra. Dr. Patelka checking over the young in the nest. They start incubating the minute the first egg is laid, resulting in varied sizes of the young in the nest. Notice the dead lemmings lying around the edge of the nest, which were in cold storage, you might say, left there uh, awaiting the need by the young. The owls were quite belligerent in uh, protecting their nest. At one point, uh, Dr. Ptilka found one of them had brought in a collared lemming, a rare species which he had not yet trapped. Here one was diving on his head, threatening to knock his hat off, and uh, it almost knocked the lens off my camera when I stood next to the nest shooting the diving bird. This was the particular snowy owl nest that interested Dr. Ptilka because of this collared lemming uh, having been brought in. Collared at Point Barrow is quite rare. And on the other side of the nest, on the left, was a least weasel that had just been brought in. It was still uh, warm and in good condition. I took the least weasel, and it is now a specimen in our collection here at Minnesota University. The snowy owl is very prolific during those seasons when there's lots of food, and sometimes they'll lay as many as 11 eggs. Well, this terminated our trip. We immediately went back over to Fairbanks and then on back down to uh, the Minneapolis airport.